So I'm really honored and excited to be here. I have to tell you, so the other night at my opening up the street, this guy came up to me and he was like, are you familiar with the hill here? And I said, yeah. And he said, you've got to go. There's this guy who's got this work up. I think he's from Africa. It's beautiful. <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah, Mr. Brown. And he said, uh, you know him? I said, yes, he's my mentor. He's <laughs> my so I felt, I felt like I was like, yeah, I know a star. I know a superstar. <laughs> so thank you for letting me hang the work and just for like letting me be a part of this journey. So I kind of know where you want to go when you're talking about your art. So I think that it's important for us to get there. We start with some foundation. And so you and I had like a really amazing conversation once where you were sharing where the art of working with fibers came from and where art came from within how you were raised. And so I wanted you to share some of that. Be more specific. So talking about like, why are you a fiber artist? And what led you to that? And what, where in your, in your childhood or in your upbringing did you find that you were an artist? I became an artist at, um, at the age of four. I became an artist. I was an artist then. <laughs> um, had I been of another hue, I'd have been a child prodigy. <laughs> oh, look, look, look. If elephants can do it, why can't I? <laughs> um, both my parents were uh, very talented people. Um, um, my father was multi-talented. He was a tailor, carpenter, interior decorator, uh, painter. He did do many things. Ma, she was an equally talented person. Um, she worked in a factory. And in the factory, she, because she had to pay most of the bills, because dad had a problem of keeping a job. Um, she worked in the factory making plastic seat covers mm -hmm. that many people of that generation, and some people still had those. <laughs> Plastic, that cold plastic <laughs> <laughs> on their couches today. That's like oh. a black household staple. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, but they both were textile people. They were textile artists and didn't really know that they were textile artists at the time. So <clears throat> at an early age, I got to see a lot of textiles. And my mother, she also was a, she studied millinery and uh, began to uh, make hats for the church ladies <laughs> and for clubs and uh, mm. cocktail hats and Easter, etc. She was, when I started felting, that was the first thing that I did, make hats. Did she felt as well? No, she didn't. Mm. <clears throat> and I had to prove to her <laughs> no, you can't, she says. You don't know what you're doing. So she was in Florida at the time, and I took some wool and stuff, and, and I was on a journey someplace, New Orleans or something. <clears throat> and I took it to her and made a hat for her to let her see that I could make a hat. And then from there, she said, oh, OK, such and such, thus and so, such and such, thus and so. So how she, old were you then? Oh, I was a grown man. I was a grown man then. Um, so but then to she back up satisfied. just a little bit, because I'm just curious, what were you making at four? What, the hat? No, when you were four, because you said that you were an artist. And oh, you were four. So were you oh, painting? Were yeah, you, yeah, or did, did you just, were you just Superman a Superman and those little, uh, you know, was it John Nagy or something in a newspaper? A little thing that you do, little drawings. I mean, somebody must remember. <laughs> <laughs> you do little drawings and you send it in, and oh, oh uh, you, yes, for school. Yeah, they had this um, for, for the art school, wasn't it? For 
I don't know what it was for, but anyway, you send it in and you win something. I just, oh, I won, I won. <laughs> you know, one of those things. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, that was the beginning, uh, you know, uh, lifting my spirit of uh, being an artist. Um, from that point on, I uh, began to, um, where was I? What did you say? <laughs> so you got you were making you got to where you were making hats. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, the felting and uh, began to um, felt hats, and from felting hats, I went to uh, felting scarves, scarves and bags and shawls and dolls. Huh? Dolls. 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 Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Began to felting dolls and things like that and whatnot. But I was marketing those items. Those were my accessory items, and I was marketing those items at that particular time until I got to a point. Now, am I going backwards or am I going forward? Well, who, who taught you how to felt? Nobody taught me how to felt. So... Um, what is that? Um, oh, that's one of my kids. <laughs> so I was trying to keep track of the time. No. <laughs> what is it? The Textile Museum. Every summer, they would have craft show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. The Textile Museum, every summer, they would have craft shows. <clears throat> and my wife and I, who she was a fantastic, may she rest in peace, she was a fantastic textile fiber artist herself to the point that she developed a program for the community, senior community, and she developed a project where as we taught seniors. <laughs> did we not? <laughs> yes, we did. We taught seniors in the community to the point that uh, they were fantastic. These people became artists and we were like, what? And they were like, whoa, these people were growing like never before. And they, this is work that they had never done. And my wife taught them uh, a deary and um, um, indigo and all sorts of um, African textile, I taught um, uh, silk painting and I taught felting. Um, Francine taught doll making and all kinds of things with what Francine do, <laughs> being Francine. And who else? Am I leaving somebody else out? Julie didn't do it, no, okay. <laughs> okay. But we reached the community and it was a great project to the point that um, how many years ago was that? 2012. 2012? 12 years. Okay. 2012, okay, I, I lose track of time. Um, somehow or other, um, in this felting, um, at some point, uh, I'm a survivor of, um, I'm a prostate cancer survivor times two. And I developed seven 60 by 40 felted, <laughs> seven 60 by 40 felted pieces. Mm. And I was still recovering from the prostate cancer and these and these pieces I began to call my healing pieces. I, um, I had a, a pool, you know, it was kiddie pools, and I put the kiddie pool down in the basement, 
and um, fill it up with water and took one of my large bamboo mats and threw it in there and started adding my felt on top of it and creating my um, uh, composition and climbed in. <laughs> <laughs> And at this point, I had two catheters. <laughs> and one was coming out of my side, because I had a blockage. And I climbed into this pool and developed seven of these things, which I can never do again, and would never do again. But they were healing pieces. Mm. They were definitely healing pieces. And I survived mm. the prostate cancer. Do you still have those pieces? <laughs> <laughs> I've begun to cut up. <laughs> I have begun to cut up a couple of them. I think I have cut up at least three of them cut them up into, and I got one on the iron board now that I was gonna cut up and head, hey, throw it on me and keep on going. <laughs> it's mine, I'll wear it. <laughs> I love that. Now, did I lose something? No, okay. no, that was really inspiring. And I feel like it's a perfect time for us to start talking about your art because you were talking about how you are a creator of the future and I think that that's a perfect illustration of like you created yourself in the future yeah. and working on those pieces. Yeah, I do see myself as a um, futuristic person. This is my 85th year and I reach, I'm constantly reaching for the future and as I look at my work, I see within my work that my work says the same thing, that all of my work talks in terms of reaching for the future. The trees have vortexes or another dimension in the tree that takes you to another dimension. The openings in the trees, the separations in the trees takes you to another world. And I realized that once we went to the door of no return in Senegal, that somehow or other it was haunting me apparently. Um, but mine is like not a door of no return, but it's a door of, this is where, this is where our freedom lies. We can leave here and go back and maybe not go back, but go to another world, another dimension, mm -hmm. to freedom. Mm -hmm. Now, these trees that are here, for the exception of the one with the DNA, um, these trees all represent um, angel oak trees that are in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And they were a part of a a series that I was working on and Time Wise is on there. I was working on a language series and I took the, and I needed an icon for the language series and the icon became the trees, which took me to South Carolina where my uh, great grandfather, D escaped, enslaved African and grandmother escaped from South Carolina. And it took me to those trees. But now I see and just, the story has unfolded even more because I see so much more because I have been able to take it there but also bring it forward. <laughs> It's the work. The work. Bring it forward from yesterday until today. 
that it has many dimensions. And as the trees go, this particular one talks in terms of DNA. Now, when I was a child, am I going to? OK. Now, when I was a child, when I was first born, my first, uh, first um, four months of life, my mother immediately took me back to her home in Ocala, Florida, to be with her family, who were my ancestors and her ancestors, because I met people who were very old people, <laughs> who were, and in looking at the census, to the 1870 census, to see all of the people that were around us that were from South Carolina, who were apparently escaped enslaved Africans. Mm. <laughs> so that DNA talks about that's where we went. And the Sankofa bird is there too that talks about the past, that DNA and the Sankofa bird are one and the same, talk about the past, the present, and the future. And those two images up there, I don't know how they got there, and I don't know how it all came about. <laughs> but every now and then I say, well, what guy? Is it Adam and Eve? No, I don't think so. <laughs> But at any rate, um, that's how the work got there, that my mother took me to the forest. And there I stayed in the forest for about, for my first four years of life until my mother arrived in Florida and as she came around, I was out in the yard and as she came around the house, she had this bundle in her arm and that was my sister. And so my first 10 years, off and on, I spent in the forest. So <laughs> from that point on was the beginning of me becoming who we see today. <laughs> <laughs> and this energy, go ahead. What about this one? This one here? Mm -hmm. It's definitely, <clears throat> it's definitely the same. Uh, it is the um, South Carolina um, angel oak tree. And the Daughters of the Dust gave me that. Because after seeing the Daughters of the Dust, I was taken by the images. And if trees can talk, <laughs> they could tell us a whole lot. Um, my thing about trees is that um, dreaming of trees equals deep-rooted thoughts. And if trees could talk, they could tell us the truth of what happened to us. During those times, if trees could talk, they'd have a lot to tell us because we were hung from trees and burned while hanging at the trees, while people had picnics. And that's where picnic came from. Well, people had picnics and were taking pictures. <laughs> As we burned. And we love picnics, don't we? So I don't understand. The culture of the cookout. <laughs> yeah. 
speaking of that, I think that's a perfect segue into these three pieces because these three pieces address some of the political violence. And I think that one of the things that fascinated me about looking at some of your older drawings was, and I said to you, like, this drawing from 1970 is politically about the same things that are happening today. And it makes you kind of have to ask a question of how much has actually changed. Tell me about it. Um, which I think that you have a vast experience of life to speak on how much has actually changed. And I think that these three pieces really start to engage that conversation. So can you tell us about the pieces, but also can you tell us the years of the pieces? No I justice, no peace. <laughs> no justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. 1960s were turbulent times for so-called curly people, <laughs> so-called Negroes, so-called a whole lot of other negative name peoples that they called us. The 1964 Bill of Rights was signed to eliminate discrimination and killing and all kinds of things that were happening to us in the black community, but it didn't eliminate nothing because it continues. It continues to happen today. So it's a lie. It's been a lie. <clears throat> this collage, <clears throat> this collage speaks to everything that happened, all the assassinations that happened to our leaders in the black community at the time. Now, I was influenced by a man who worked, who was a freelance artist at um, Ebony Magazine, and his name was Roy Lewis. <laughs> because he did the Wall of Respect in Chicago. And I was influenced by that article that I had a brick wall and I had all the, everything that happened in the community was happening in communities throughout. I would put on my brick wall, brick wall, brick wall. But I was constantly moving from one place to another, always in the middle of the night, getting out of these people's, because I couldn't pay the rent, <laughs> getting them to go someplace. <laughs> At any rate, um, this speaks to all of those killings of <laughs> all of our leaders during that time. It also speaks to the power of the Black Panthers who were protecting the community and helping the community and feeding the community and taking care of the community as social workers would do. But the powers that be saw them as a menace to the community. And they were not a menace to the community. They were only a menace to the powers that be. Anyway, what was happening during that time? And Lord, I'm going to take freedom. And this, this lady here was for real. She existed, this woman. She existed. Charles White painted her somewhere in the 60s, I believe. He did, I think it was the 60s. I couldn't find my book to track back on it. But she existed. She was on 125th Street as we lived in Harlem. She was on 125th Street selling shopping bags. Striking figure. I wish I could get her, could have gotten her history, but I was a child. I was a child. How did I know? Because as I think back now, well, how did she 
First of all, how did she get there? And who came to take her home or where she came from? Did a limousine come and get her? I get all <laughs> crazy. Did a limousine come and get her? <laughs> what? <laughs> but at any rate, this woman existed. And grandma would take us down to Hunter and Fish Street to go to the store and pay the bills and so on and so forth. And she'd speak to us. We'd talk. So she did exist. That was beginning, and from there, 1968, this drawing appeared. Now, I was a student at, um, I started out at Art Students League. Art Students League did, um, did not, um, to me the, at that time, Art Students League um, was not enough discipline for me. And apparently, I was not supposed to be there. <laughs> so I went to School of Visual Arts, all part-time, because I couldn't afford full-time. I didn't understand the educational system. And so it was all part-time. So after I left the School of Visual, I mean, Art Students League, I went to um, School of Visual Arts. And that's when my graphic drawings and lines began. And my graphic lines started in the 60s and has been consistent throughout. So is that futuristic? Is that futuristic or is it not? That's futuristic. <laughs> Is that futuristic or is it not? That. Now, this piece is very delicate because I didn't know nothing about paper. And somebody, and I didn't have no money. And somebody, oh Lord, and somebody gave me a big roll of paper. The paper wasn't too good in the first place, and I didn't know quality of paper. And this piece of paper, this paper, bless you, I'm so happy that you got a frame on you. <laughs> Because this just got framed about three weeks ago. <laughs> and thank God for this exhibition because this thing was about to fall apart. The paper was so... Anyway, it's that. And then I recreated it and more information has occurred. And it talks in terms of the different belief systems that I have been looking at and seeing and hearing and experiencing these belief systems. And it talked about this death cross that you really find in the cemetery. All of the silk started when I was um, marketing these silks. This is the oldest piece here. This goes back to 1993. And now my history is that I am, I have been a student of astrology for 50 plus years. Student. I do not claim to be an astrologer because that's a 24 hour job. Now, my cousin here, <laughs> I taught her mama, and her mama is a 24-hour astrologer mm -hmm. today. Is she not, baby girl? She is. Yes, indeed. I became a registered nurse. That's why I talk in terms of health care and human behavior, etc because um, I was always concerned about human behavior, elves, always as a child, as an introvert. You would not think that I was an introvert, but I'm an introvert. And my voice, I didn't get my voice until my work began to give me my voice. So I talk in terms of 
the healthcare system, um, and what has happened to us as the healthcare system. Uh, there's a problem in the healthcare system. Um, there's a shortage of doctors, and there's a shortage of nurses in the healthcare system. And this is deliberate. This is something that's deliberate. <laughs> because at one time, there were medical schools all across the country, black. But we were training black doctors. So by design, they limited, eliminated they eliminated, and I say they, I'm talking about the system, eliminated black doctors down to, and black hospitals down to, how many black hospitals we got now? Just a handful, if that. And the doctors and the nurses, there's a shortage. I was in the healthcare system as a registered nurse for near 30 years, damn near 30 years. And there was always a shortage. They was always importing nurses from foreign countries. And they're still doing it. My silks began with the pieces that have been shown. And the pieces that have been shown were cut up into strips begin to cut them up into strips because I stopped doing the painting of the silks and then they were cut up into strips and these strips have become what we see today in all of these are strips of silk and these when I run out of I'll be cutting these up too <laughs> to create the pieces that you see here today. And uh, the other nine that's up at uh, the Strathmore, there's a whole room full up there at Strathmore, but they all come from strips of silk that have been cut. This last one, tell Your us favorite. the story, yes. I love this one. <laughs> Okay, this last one. I said that I'm a student of astrology. <clears throat> twenty twenty. Everybody's life changed in this room and globally. Everybody's life changed throughout the globe. Did it not? Yeah. <laughs> and they call it the pandemic, right? right. Mm -hmm. I become a part of the um, installation. <laughs> Zodiacs are generally circles, but mine is not a circle, it's a square. This represents Capricorn and Four or five planets lined up in Capricorn in January of 2020. And when they lined up in 2020, the world stopped and people became fearful, anxious, angry, violent, confused. The gamut of every emotion people became People started to die. As you watch television, your phone, or your laptop, all you saw were red dots on each corner. On each corner, you see eyes and a mask. And the mask is the red dots of all the people that have died. It's not over yet. So this piece, I have documented something that is timeless. All of my work, there's future in all of my work. 
Why do I say there's future in all of my work? Because there's hidden images in my work. Hidden images in the work that allows me to create new bodies of work. So that's future. Is it not? Mm -hmm. the, the works behind you, the compositions are beautiful. Very, very beautiful. They're mesmerizing. It's hard to turn away from them because of their intricacy, um, the, the different sensations from the different portions of the composition. So my question for you is, how the hell did you come up with that? When you start this type of a work, your silk, you're using your silk cuttings, talk, if you can, a bit about the development of the composition. Well, it happens on a, it happens on a conscious and, and unconscious level because it starts happening when I'm doing my doodling, the graphic lines, that's when, and that doodling and the graphic lines is like um, automatic writing that the writers go through, and the writer, some writers can write a whole book and didn't know what they wrote. Mm -hmm. That's what happens. I'd like to know about the colors. Do you dye some of your pieces, all of your pieces? Do you get some already colored? Now, when you say dye, are we talking about the silk? The, the silk and the felting and the wool as well. Um, uh, the wool, I mean, it's got a... <laughs> They have a rainbow of colors that you send away <laughs> for and you get the colors. At one time I did die and went, why am I dying? I can send away for the colors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the silk, um, um, actually the silk paints, the silk paints are already there and you just paint on the silk. You get a white piece of silk and you start painting on it. James, I know you have some interesting uh, responses to pieces, but I heard that uh, one visitor an appreciator, um, talk about your compositions. Um, another asked about uh, colors, and someone else also asked about astrology and terms. But when you're working on these pieces, I know that you're invested in them. Is there, do you find that you're constantly working on layers, and then how much time is invested within that, um, especially with the silk, because oh, it's so okay. delicate? <laughs> it starts out, there's at least, each one of them, it, there's at least four layers. Mm -hmm. I thought there were more. There may be more, mm -hmm. but it's a minimum of four layers from the original abstract, because once all of these are sewn together, it's abstract. Mm -hmm. Once they're stitched together, it's abstract. And then when I begin to start my doodling and graffiti lines. Then I begin to pull the, the images together. And then the next stage is the coloring. And that's when they, the colors change, because I can change this color. I can eliminate the, this color. And this doesn't exist anymore. But I can change. So there's more than Three levels, several levels. And all of these are based on the narrative or your emotional connection to the pieces? All these are based on the narrative. I don't always know what the narrative is. <laughs> it's as the spirit gives it to me. Mm -hmm. It brings it to me. And then I, because another thing with and that's primarily with the work that's up at um, the Strathmore. You can turn them in four different directions. Mm -hmm. And in turning the pieces in four different directions, you got a different image. Each direction, you got a different image. And so I'm saying that, especially those up there in Strathmore, each painting is a different painting. And that's just one that can be turned in four different directions. 
And I've had in my mind trying to find or think in terms of a device that would turn it periodically mm -hmm. so as the audience could participate and interact with the hidden images that they find. I know that you spent time in New York and, um, um, and I know that you've been here in Washington, D.C. And I want to know, um, I'm looking at your palette, and I want to know where did you, where did this palette, these, these colors, this use of these intense uh, colors, when did they, were they always with you? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I came here with it. <clears throat> Yeah, I came here with it. Uh, James Brown, first of all, congratulations on having two exhibitions at the same time here and at the Strathmore. And, <laughs> and I'm three. Three, okay. Well, congratulations. And I'm, cu I'm curious now, I uh, would like for you to talk a little bit about the challenges of being a tapestry artist and a fiber artist in terms of finding exhibition places throughout your career? Now, when you say challenges, I'm yeah. very, I, I realize that I'm very selective. Okay. And there's just certain places that I'm just not going to show mm -hmm. because it's not worth my time. I did not just get here. My work has been in many shows throughout the district and a show I'm in a show ongoing in in New York at this point with a doll <laughs> who would who would have thunk <laughs> Francine. Francine wants me to talk about my dolls at any rate did I answer your question yes okay Francine wants me the <laughs> The mother of dolls, <laughs> the creator of dolls, wants me to talk about my dolls. She challenged me to make dolls. So I started twisting the felt and twisting the felt and then just wrapping string around the felt, or uh, cord around the felt, what it was, wire, whatever it was, around the felt. And then I realized that, oh, I can dress them up with my silk. Mm -hmm. So I started wrapping my silk around them. <clears throat> so that's how my dolls came about, little small things. But the one, that, the one that I really love is the one that is in the show mm -hmm. in New York City because it is a um, sculpture head, two heads. That court, and I talk in terms of being in this world, but not of it. Did I answer your question? <laughs> I wanted to get um, a little feel for your thinking process at the beginning of your project, during the project, and after. Because you said that you were guided to create your works. Um, did you overthink any time? Like, did you hesitate or did you just go for it? And how did you process after the art was finished? So um, my problems are solved in a lot of problems. I do a lot of problem solving in my sleep to complete my work. And um, the ancestors are definitely there because it's things that come from uh, my head, my heart, to my hands. I wanted to know who, if you had any artists that influenced your work. Well, I noticed earlier you mentioned Charles White. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Charles White. <laughs> Yes, Charles White. Charles White, uh, of course, in my earlier days, that's all I was doing was ebony pencil, pen and ink, drawings, 
Charles White, because I got a whole cabinet, five drawers with drawings. I have one quick question. Um, how did you go about selecting this particular work for the show? Because you have so much work. And also for the curator, what was the process in hanging the work? Uh, when you say I have that so much work, this work was designated because of no justice and no peace, because that was the, um, the proposal that I wrote. And it was timely because of the Bill of Rights. So the first pieces that I submitted were these three definitely were the first pieces that hit directly on no justice, no peace. And then the silk, no justice, no peace, no justice, no peace, no justice, no peace. So those are the pieces, those are the pieces that were submitted at first. And in order to be in the big room, Tim <laughs> said I had to have more pieces. <laughs> so that's how the rest of the people pieces got in the show. Um, so as for curating it, when I came and I unrolled everything and kind of just sat with what the relationships were between the works. And I think it's interesting that you started out talking about the trees because one of the things that fascinates me about trees is they do talk to each other. Yes. And they tend to like, they'll lean toward each other yes. so that they can communicate with each other. And so immediately I felt that these pieces were in that kind of conversation and needed to be together because they, they, they are talking to each other. Um, and I felt like this side of the room has some of that, like when, you have a, when you've seen a tree that's like 300 years old, you feel it from the tree. And so this side of the room just felt like it was kind of the, like the ancestors are standing along this wall and looking into everything else. And then I walked in and out a whole bunch of times to think about when I come into this space, what is going to make me surrender to this room? Because there is so much spiritual energy in all of the pieces. And this one is pretty much when you're coming in directly in eye line. And I felt like this one tells us what to experience from all of the pieces, because it also has a tree, but it also has that, that no justice, no peace elements um, embedded within it. And I felt like this was the perfect invitation into the conversation of the space. So it kind of lures you in and then you turn around and realize the ancestors are standing behind you. So you have to hold a sense of responsibility as you witness the conversation that is happening in the rest of the pieces. Um, I think that I was also really um, interested in the stories around the materiality. So how this work that is fiber interacts with these works that are not necessarily as much um, exposed fiber. And, you know, and how that balances with the drawings and, you know, with the collage. So I was really very sensitive to like, how is the materials going to flow? So that's how these ended up here because I felt like they were the bridge between this circle of conversations. So I'm really like preoccupied right now with um, particularly if we're having like a conversation around like black justice or black politics that you have to hold a sense of responsibility. You don't get to just stand in front of the painting and be like, oh, it's a noose or oh, that's Trayvon Martin. Like, you know, you're witnessing the ancestors are watching you. Mm -hmm. So if you witness it incorrectly, you are seen as you leave this space. That's my thought process. <laughs> I think that's a perfect opportunity to begin to close out the program. What a wonderful conversation. Great questions from all of you.